Thanks for coming. Um, I'm just going to show a bunch of slides, and I'll probably be a little slow at first, but hopefully I'll be able to get into this. And um, I'm going to show some, some. Oh, anyway, I'll just get started. We go with clutch cargo. Um, I get asked about where, where my imagery, where my storytelling, my story ideas come from. Um, when I was growing up, I didn't watch a lot of TV. I wasn't allowed to watch TV, but occasionally. And there were like, when I was a kid, there'd be like, a, like an afternoon show that, that showed kids' cartoons, and one of them was Clutch Cargo. Uh, and the one thing that was very um, disturbing about Clutch Cargo is they, it was very cheaply animated, so they, they would uh, actually use live actors to, uh, to have the mouths move. Uh, so you just have this very still image in a, in a very disturbing, <laughs> it's got to be a woman's mouth with you know, very nice dark lipstick. Um, but I think that was the first thing I saw on television that I had to actually leave the room because I was like so <laughs> frightened. Uh, uh, but didn't read, didn't didn't watch a lot of TV. Later on, I, I watched plenty. Um, one thing that my parents had around the house was a lot of books, and my father had art books, uh, books on illustration, books on comics, and. Um, I was, a, I was a kid that hung out by myself a lot. I had an older sister, she went off to school. My mom didn't really go out of her way to kind of like figure out that I needed play dates. So uh, I was like kind of figured out things on my own and, and wandered through and grabbed books off the shelf and, and, uh, and looked at a lot of stuff very early on. So before I could actually read, I was looking at a lot of books, a lot of illustrations and trying to make some sense of them. Um, this is one that was incredibly disturbing to me. Uh, an amazing, uh, an amazing artist, and I'm going to get his name. I can't pronounce it probably. But Boris Ar Archibashev. Do you know how to pronounce his name? Okay, that's going to be close enough. Um, but you can probably imagine, you know, what a, a five-year-old brain would think of this. You know, spending, meditating on this for a while. Um, there was books, but you know, there was an illustration by Domier, which again, th this is like, I didn't. It wasn't something that my parents were, you know, sitting me down and talking about and discussing. I was just pulling books off the shelf and looking at things, and there was just something incredibly horrible about seeing this, you know, a headless corpse and these skeletons and a little baby skeleton walking along. Of course, later as an adult, I I had some sense of what, you know, where this came from. But as a kid, I was I was just really absorbed and, and, and focused on what those images were. 
Um, for example, my dad had a book on, on illustrators, and this was uh, showing you know, various illustrators and what they do, and, and this was about folds and people's clothing. Uh, and when I was looking at it, it looked like, I don't know, these are they're ghosts because there's, you know, there's nobody inside those clothes. And there was something kind of scary about the fact that it was these kind of deep, dark folds and there was nobody inside those clothes. Um, and another thing that I looked at that I probably shouldn't have, my dad, my dad was interested in comics. He, he, he kind of grew up with newspaper comics and um, he, in the, in the late 50s, um, Mad Magazine, well actually Mad Comic, before it was actually a magazine, they collected some of the black and white comics, um, and my dad had a stack of those. And I think he regrets the fact that I spent way, much, way too much time looking at them. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the artists, well anyway, the, their paperback books collection of what would originally be uh, comic books uh, done in color, uh, but these ones were in black and white. Um, and again, this I couldn't read, and I didn't really know what the cultural references were or what the stories were about. But there were, there was just something about the look of the artwork and the subject matter um, that I spent a lot of time with. Um, this is Will Elder, who is one of my favorite artists. You can kind of see where I might have looked at his his dark brush lines and thought about that a lot. Um, yeah, for example, I didn't know who Wonder Woman was, but uh, here's this kind of voluptuous woman who looks like she's getting tortured. Uh, originally, in the uh, in the color version of this comic, these guys are wearing kind of skin-tight outfits, but here in black and white, it looks like they're just naked guys with machine guns. Uh, this is a parody of uh, Sherlock Holmes, and they're just they're, there's something incredibly atmospheric and, and surreal and strange about. Uh, just the look of the of the artwork. It's it's. Oh, I don't know why that's coming up there. Okay, are we okay? Um, and this one too, you know, no, no holds barred. You know, here's the big shit monster, and here's the guy's <laughs> drop. You know, his pants are. He's got a lock on the back of his long johns that's broken because he's. I don't know. It's pretty amazing stuff. <laughs> um, and I mentioned my dad earlier. My my dad was interested in the arts, but was always kind of approached it as, a, as more as a, a hobbyist and, and someone who, like he did woodcut, he, I mean he did, um, he did printmaking, he did uh, car wood carving, he did like every imaginable hobby you could do, stamp collecting, everything else, but one of the things he did was, he did his, he was interested in comics, so he did his kind of fake versions of comics or copied things. So um, what you see on, this side is the original, the original drawing from a, it, was, it wasn't a how-to book on comics, but it was a book about cartooning. And, and on the right, you see my father's version of that. And so at a really early age, I was actually seeing that, that there was people that made marks on paper, and that's how it was done. It, was like, it, was, it seemed, to my eyes, it, it was like kind of impossible that someone could letter that tightly or, or make those kinds of marks. It, it seemed very, you know, kind of amazing to me. And also just had a, a general sense that this is something that someone could do. Um, and the thing that was good too eventually was the fact that he had those tools around. He had a bottle of India ink. When I learned that you could, you know, you're supposed to use ink and crow quill pens, I, I was able to actually test those things out later on. Um, another thing he had, uh, again, he was a hobbyist. Uh, and, and all the things that he did were copies. So he had a, he had a kind of a sketchbook, not a sketchbook, like a, a notebook that he pasted things in. And way back in the day, I, people used to keep uh, files of uh, reference files, uh, swipe files, uh, things you could use for reference. And when my dad was actually cutting stuff out of the newspapers, and I didn't, I couldn't decipher it early on. But if you look up in the up in the corner there, it's like full figure. You know, seven eighths, three fourths, half, one quarter. So I, it just kind of a, he's he's almost like a mathematician. He was like saying, you know, okay, here's here's my reference file of three quarters figure or whatever it was. You notice that they're all really cute women too. Um, 
at some point he also just started tasting in random strips. So he kind of you could tell that he started out with a with a plan and then moved on to, you know, like, like let's fill this in. Um, so you you know you know standing figure female it says F for female standing figure. Um, and you know you also notice that there's you know a, again lots of voluptuous women. Uh, so I was looking at all this stuff early on. Another thing that was, was unique for someone of my generation was that I, I grew up uh, reading Tintin and uh, the Hergé books. Uh, in the early 60s, there were, I think, Golden Press put out maybe six uh, American editions of Tintin, and they didn't really, they didn't really sell very well. So, um, but I was lucky enough, my dad, again, uh, bought a series of books, and for me, they were just—they were—they were the best. They were just really amazing. Um, some of these are some of these are French editions, just because I shot slides in them that way. Um, I mean, one thing that was really amazing to me were like the there was like you open up the book and you had these amazing end papers, just kind of beautiful display of cast of characters. And when I was a kid, I had you know a, a limited. I had maybe four books at first, and I would look endlessly at these pages of all the other characters that weren't in the actual stories that I had, and and really want to read those books really badly. Uh, and the same thing as looking at the back cover, there were there were some scenes that I recognized, but like off on the you know off in the corner there was like a like a castle, and as a kid I was just like imagining what that story could be, just you know just just amazing. Um, and so naturally, I kind of internalized all that stuff, and I've ri ripped him off shamelessly uh, over the years. This is a back cover for um, for a, for an edition of uh, Big Baby's Blood Club, and I can't, I don't think I can read it, but I even took the the I even changed the original quotes, and uh, and anyway, went that far, and I've stolen the end papers as well. Uh, and here's here's my favorite book was Secret of the Unicorn, which is probably the first one I got. And and there was something very there, there's one scene that's very mysterious, and I I don't know I just I reread it endlessly. Tintin is 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 kidnapped and uh, knocked out and wakes up in this kind of this vault of some building. He doesn't know where he is, but you know that he's really scared because he's got sweat flying off of him. So ha ha ha. Admit it, you're scared. Come closer to the door. Come closer. Come a little closer. Good. Now look, there's an intercom. Now keep in mind that I can't read and I've never heard of, I don't know what an intercom is. I have no idea. But I know that there's a little hole in the wall and, and that thing's speaking. So in my mind, that was this, this kind of very surreal, odd mouth embedded in a wall. So if you see something like that in my work, you'll recognize where that comes from. Anyway, here's my, my punk tin tin. Um, before I started this series, I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to do have, have a story that was set in the late 70s. I, I, was, I was in the, around the Bay Area in the late 70s when the, the whole kind of punk movement, movement was starting up. And um, I, wanted to, I wanted to think about that setting. I was in art school. Uh, and it was, for me, it was a, a great time. It was, it was, I was at this concert. There was Mark Mothersbaugh from Devo. Um, and what was really kind of interesting at that time was that the whole punk aesthetic or the idea of what that was was not really defined. So you've got this guy, he's got, he's got kind of a leather jacket on, he's worked that out, but he's still got the kind of heavy metal look. And the guy in the background is, you know, he's, he's working on the tie. You know, anyway, I just, uh, these are, uh, this is a photo by Ruby Ray who, who documented uh, a lot of the, the punk scene during that time. She, there's, a, there's a book of her work that's great. Um, this is another one. Or just something great about looking at audience shots. Like there's two people that are in bands and then you got the guy in the middle that's got, still got the kind of early 70s mustache and the whole bit, but anyway. So I really wanted to try to think about that time period or have my characters uh, set in that time period. These are some Polaroids I took. Uh, when I was in art school, I did drawings and sculpture. I 
did photography, ba very bad performance art, uh, which luckily, you know, hopefully will never surface. It's been videotaped on black and white, half inch, reel to reel video, so, so I think it's in my friend's, right, somewhere. anyway. Uh, but I took, I took uh, portraits of friends. This is Winston Tong from uh, Tuxedo Moon, who was one of the Bay Area bands. Uh, this is Carol Detweiler, who is uh, in Pink Section, and the Inflatable Boy Clams, which is one of the best band names ever. Okay, another little section of Tinden. This is a little segue, and now let's go. Hurrah, that did it. So I, when, when, I was, when I was thinking about this story, I, I was really, I kept on going back to Tintin and, and, and thinking about the whole, that whole punk experience, and I could not kind of push myself into the, or find a way into the story. And I finally, my wife got into a, a very bad accident, a bicycle accident, and it you know, stared the hell out of me. And I just said, I'm just gonna start with this scene. And, I, and I, that was my entry point. Uh, looking through this brick wall and, and stepping into another world and al allowing, allowing things to happen. Um, having a, a main character, so the character on the right is, is Doug, who's kind of a stand-in for myself during that time period. I never had groovy hair, trust me, uh, or nice well, dark hair. Uh, and, then, and then this character, Knit Knit, who's not really supposed to be you know, kind of a dark, evil Tintin or anything like that, but still just has some of, you know, some of those attributes, the little, the hair. So I, I, I decided I was doing like three books, and in each book there's, there's, it cuts to a certain time period in, in this character's life. So the first book looks like this, second one, a third one. And the first book is X'd out, the hive, and as Alvin mentioned, just had Sugar Skull come out. And they were really conceived of in the tradition of the, the kind of Franco-Belgian albums, there, uh, which, is, which is the normal way of making comics over, over in that part of the world. Um, usually, usually 64 pages. Uh, and sometimes they're series, sometimes they're self-contained books. In, in this case, I wanted to have self-contained books, but they would tell a complete story. Okay, this is it. It's um, three, six, two, seven, eight, three, and voila, you're in. Oh, and here's your map. Whatever you do, don't lose it or you'll be up shit crick without a fucking paddle. Well, I guess I better get going. Aren't you forgetting something? Oh gosh, I'm so sorry, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for everything. I really, really appreciate this. No stupid ass, the flashlight. You're gonna need a flashlight, it's dark down there. I have to get some water. You don't wanna hear it. Be careful and remember, if you get caught, it's your ass. Don't tell them anything. You don't even know me, right? Right. So take it easy and hey, give your special lady a great big kiss for me. Um, okay, and thanks again. Let's see, at the bottom of ladder, take first door on the left. I guess that's it. Ew. And I won't try to do the sound effects here, but you can you can fill them in yourself. <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't mean to bother you. What's next? Why does this have to be so difficult? Oh, great. When you reach the room with skulls, take a right and continue to stairway. The floors are numbered. Exit on the 23rd floor. And after that, I should know my way around. Ah, oh, gosh, finally. Holy crap. Two more hours until break and I'm fucking starved. You know what I got a hankering, you know what I got a hankering for? A big bowl of those cheese grits, mm. Or maybe flapjacks and bluefish, that shit's mighty tasty. You're gonna be tasting my fist if you don't shut your yap. Come on, you can do it. You know you, know you can do it. Hey there, what took you so long? I've been waiting forever. And so you hear, you see her, she's reading a, Reading a comic, and and I've always had a I've always had a weak spot in my heart for romance comics, and, and I kind of I, I incorporated this whole idea of of her reading 
this character reading romance comics, but in, in some sort of foreign language. So here's, here's one that appears in the, in the book as well. Um, here's a little illustration that, that, that starts out um, Sugar Skull, where he's looking at a newsstand. You see kind of uh, romance comics, men's magazines, uh, Mexi what looked like Mexican wrestling magazine, kids' comics. Another thing I was fascinated by uh, later on was, was coming across weird foreign editions of uh, Tintin. And this is a Chinese edition where I couldn't tell when I looked at, opened it up. It's all in black and white in the interior, but the entire book was redrawn because the Tintin stories are in color, but they wanted to publish it. So it was basically, a, in, the whole volume was traced. And if you, and you can't see it unless you look really carefully, but this, I mean, you can see it on the cover, but there was something about that that kind of felt a little bit more removed and, and odd to me. Um, here's some other Tintin tin covers from China. And I actually stole the, uh, the design for one of my books from, from this. In a very, very odd looking snowy, I don't know if you know Tintin, tin, but. And, and one of the things I did was, for my own pleasure to begin with, was to create a whole series of, uh, of fake knit-knit comics, um, fake foreign comics, and I, I did a, a whole series of those. Eventually, I'm going to put together a, some kind of art book related, you know, collecting all these various pieces that, that, are, that I did in addition to um, the series. So here's um, a lot of themes in the book show up. Got some fetal pigs in there. That one's particularly nasty looking. So yeah, this is the, uh, I, I went so far as to do a uh, kind of a fake foreign edition of, of, of the Knit Knit stories. Um, this is called Johnny 23 and it was published by a, a French publisher called uh, Dernier Cree. And uh, in that I actually worked out a, a typeface, made my own typeface, foreign typeface. Um, and published it and had it printed in purple ink, so it kind of looked like there's a lot of Japanese comics I saw in this kind of beautiful purple ink, and a lot of uh, Mexican comics. Uh, so I just wanted to have that that kind of look, a warm paper with this kind of purple ink, and I and I restructured or, or, or cut up the existing stories and reconfigured everything. What I didn't realize is that it's not that hard to to decipher the the writing because I did a, I was just touch typing, but not really knowing what I was, there was some music going on, and I had some bad rock lyrics in there. So actually, you can find the translation online somewhere. Uh, another thing that I've always uh, been attracted to is uh, romance comics. So there was a certain point where they were, they were kind of the comics that nobody was really interested in collecting, and so you could find them cheap, but there was, I was always, kind of drawn to that. They, they weren't superheroes, they weren't crime, they weren't, they were just about, you know, you know, men and women, their relationships, or, you know, they were, I don't know, there's something kind of intriguing about that. And there's some, some that were kind of sleazy, <laughs> as, you, as you can see. She's saying, and just what must I do to get those? <laughs> and a guy in the, a guy in the center there, you know, I don't know where he came from. So I've been doing my bad versions of uh, romance comics as well. These are actually based on later comics put out by Charlton, which are kind of the, we used to be the, the cheapest, cheapest comics ever. Um, and because there was, I think there was probably very little editorial process going on, there, there were some really odd comics. So I've always been kind of drawn to those. So Teen Diary, little subtitles, Teens in Trouble. Teenage romances, which would, which should, you must include gay romance. And then I did some foreign, foreign versions too. The, the one on the, uh, the one on the left there is taken directly from a pa an existing panel of a comic. I did, I did not alter it that much. You can tell that the person's like referencing probably some guy out of a, a clothing, ca you know, catalog or something like that. Just. It looks totally bizarre. I didn't change her face that much either. There's a few more. 
again, these are taken from existing, all, all, almost these, all of these are kind of, I can't, you know, I would not be able to figure it out on my own. And, and I've also been doing some fake men's magazines that are, they kind of move towards like a, a real kind of, something kind of sad and disturbing. Um, like, there's lost, lonely, and unloved, sad girls with no future. I think I've, I've done three of them, but I'm not gonna, I'm, it's too, I just, never mind. I've got to move on. Uh, some of the characters in my story are, they're, they're, they're in there because, you know, they're, they're having difficult times. And so here's one of the characters that is going to be in the art book. And, and, and the kind of horrors that she's going through are not related to, they're much more internal. Um, Catholic guilt and, I don't know, bad art school. Um, here's the last little section here I'm going to do. Um, this, is from, this is from Sugar Skull as well. I hate to say it, but after the first couple of drinks, uh, I hate to say it, but the first couple of drinks felt good, soothing. But it didn't stop there. I just kept going and going. After a while, I, Sally, sweetheart, are you awake? Why do I keep dragging her into this? She's listened to enough of my endless whining. She always tells me the past is the past. You have, to, you have to let it go. And I thought I could. I thought I was ready to move on, but I was wrong. Come on, Sarah, we've got to figure this out. When did he get out of jail? Why didn't you tell me? Nikki saw him at a night at a, at a, I'm sorry. Nikki saw him a few nights ago at a club. I didn't tell you because I didn't want you to get upset. Upset? Now he knows I'm up here with you. He heard my voice on the intercom. But he's never seen you. He doesn't know what you look like. And I don't know what he looks like. But I bet you still have a photo of him. You do, don't you? Just show me. I need to know what he looks like. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. I really am. I never wanted to get you caught up in all of this. What's his name? He never told me his name. It's Larry. Larry? You mean like Larry from the Three Stooges? Jesus. And what are all those other photos? Why can't I look at those? You don't want to look at these, I promise. Why not? What do you have to hide from me? Fine. Look all you want. I'm going to go take a shower. Shit. All oh, shit. That's enough. It's okay, don't worry. We're going to be okay. We just have to be really, really careful. He can never find out who I am. But we can still see each other, okay? We can meet over at my apartment. It should be safe there. I mean, it feels so good. Just lean forward a little. I never want to get her pregnant. Why would I want that? It was a mistake. An accident. That's all it was. Doug? She was slipping away, and I just was trying to hold on. Doug? And I was going to fade out and end there on that very sad note, but I'm going to show something else I've done. This is probably just as sad, but uh, recently I've, <laughs> moving right along, um, recently I did a, a collaboration with a, a French artist, Kielhofer, and it was, it was, I don't do many collaborations, but the idea was that we would send artwork back and forth in the mail. Um, the only theme was, was the Garden of Eden, or the, or, you know, the, the, the apple, apples in the Garden of Eden. Um, and of course, I've been doing all those uh, romance covers that I showed you, so I was kind of stuck on, on bad romance imagery. And it's, he has a very, very odd style. The, all of his work is done in, in black pencil on paper and has this very strange gradated look to everything. It's a little bit washed out here. But he's a pretty amazing artist, if you, if you haven't seen him. He, he, he works in a number of styles. It does get sad in the end, too. What can I say? <laughs> and that's it. And now if we can cheer up a little, or if I can cheer up a little bit. Uh, <laughs> we can uh, ask questions. So, any questions? Now I 
spooked the hell out of everybody. So they're all <laughs> feeling bad. Sorry about that. Anybody? Questions? Anything? No? Yeah, right there. Sure, sure. Yeah, um, he was asking about the process of, or, or how I work. Uh, and usually I buy really cheap notebooks and just start writing and writing and writing. Uh, and I buy cheap no notebooks so I don't feel intimidated by them or you know, I, I don't need to fill them with beautiful drawings. Uh, so I'll make visual notations, but mainly, uh, mainly writing. So I just start gathering ideas. It's the words and the ideas that come first and sometimes uh, visual images. Um, as far as like the actual way that I start a comic, it can be a thumbnail, breaking it, breaking down the story uh, in, a, in a thumbnail or just the page. Um, but when I start uh, actually working on the physical page, I do the lettering. The lettering gets done first. Um, I work on layers of tracing paper. I work very, if you saw the pencils, they're very, very kind of scrubbed in very loose pencils and they get refined and refined and I finally use a light table and, and, and do a final drawing and use a, a brush and uh, for straight lines I use a rapidograph but yeah it's pretty it's pretty simple straightforward material but I guess, I guess the best way to describe it is just taking it's just reducing things it's starting with uh, letting every idea in and trying not to censor anything um, I mean there's things that I've done that that I find I don't know if I can draw this or if I should draw this. I feel actually feel bad about some things, but I try, I try to allow all those things in and try to try to turn them turn them over in my head and think you know think about what they are and what they mean. Um, and then the, it, it slowly slowly gets distilled into the, the final piece. And I and I do work very slowly, unfortunately. Anybody else? Anybody here? Oh sure, sure. I mean, all that stuff. I mean, it was uh, he was asking about uh, different influences and whether music uh, influenced me. And uh, sure, I think at a certain point, especially when I was younger, when there were, I guess, LPs are all coming back in again. But there was something about you know record album art that I would sit and probably spend way too much time looking at. Yeah, I probably smoked too much pot and looked at Yes album covers <laughs> way, way too long. Uh, that one's a good one. Uh, but as far as music's concerned, I don't know whether I mean I've played music and I and I and I enjoy music and I listen to music while I'm while I'm working sometimes not when I'm writing but when I'm drawing. Um, I don't know whether whether it's a particular influence necessarily. Um, probably some of the visuals find their find their way in there. Um, yeah, I don't know if I can go further than that. Anybody else? It's from, uh, not necessarily. I mean, I think, uh, he was asking whether I, I'm, I'm, I don't, I won't paraphrase, but uh, when, I, when I'm working, I'm trying, it, it's, a lot of it's kind of, it sounds dumb, but it, it's self-discovery. It's, it's, it's trying to dig into something, uh, trying to find out. I mean, I, I started this t series thinking like, okay, this is gonna be about that, that period of my life when I was involved in punk and art school and that sort of thing. And it ended up really just being that that was really pretty much the setting, and it turned into a very different story. There was there was elements that entered into it that I thought were very minor, that ended up being very like a very important part of the story. Um, you know, I was just going to say something, but I can't. Uh, sorry. Um, but yes, what's what's interesting to me, I usually have a kind of a skeletal structure or, or you know a structure to the story. I have some sense of where who the characters are and, and how they interact and where they're going to be going. Um, but it's open enough to have, you know, how that's interpreted. That's open and also I allow other things to enter into it that wouldn't occur to me necessarily. There, when you're, during the process of, of sitting down and drawing, there's, it's, your brain thinks in a different way. Um, 
I've never worked from a big, long, full script or anything like that. It would be, that, that would kind of feel like filling in the blanks or something like that. But the whole process of, of, of doing comics for me is, is, is allowing all those ideas to percolate and rise up to the surface. And, and yeah, that's, I knew what the end was. I knew what the characters are gonna go through, the, the, the core of, of that. But I was kind of surprised at some of the things that surfaced, which was, which was good for me. Anybody else? Yeah, back here. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it doesn't, visually, I, it doesn't, in these books it's a little more obvious, but visually the, the kind of immediate look of my influences would be kind of the earlier mad stuff that you're looking at, or kind of comics from the 50s or the, moving into the 60s where there's this very heavy brush line, a uh, very kind of like a real solidity to everything. Um, the things that I loved about Hergé and Tintin is that there was this, it really was a world that you could enter into. There was something that, there was something that happened there. There was, there was the way that he put the figures together. Um, again, you were saying that, yeah, eventually he had a team of people that he was, that were coloring his work and, and helping with backgrounds and so on. But you can look at his early, his early work that he did, every, you know, most everything himself, and it's it's all there too. He's re he, he was pretty remarkable, but there was for me there was something about it that you were you could maybe it was the color or the combination of storytelling, but it was something I could really enter into, and and that again it's that indefinable sort of thing that that uh, that stuck with me, um, but uh, yeah. I did. I, I did want to do a, a book in color, uh, and 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 I, and I enjoyed the fact that that I could use color as a part of the storytelling. It wasn't just kind of a a colorized a colorized version of my black and white stuff. So that that was actually kind of a, a, a really fun thing to work with as well. That's one of the questions I was going to ask. Actually, is um, your previous titles, all your main primary works, have all been in black and white? And the color did add a lot of layers. I mean, just the, yep. the story structure and everything. But um, is this something you think you'll continue with? You miss working in black and white, or is this? Is it? Yeah, this I, 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 I honestly going? don't know. I, I realized, again, on the the project that I'm working on now, I kind of jumped into it because I don't know how many people do this kind of work, but that are sitting here. But um, I always want to be immersed in something. I want to. I want to have that feeling of being immersed in work and, and moving forward. And there is a period where you need to kind of reevaluate and, and step back. And maybe it's not a matter of reinventing yourself, but maybe not just repeating what you've done before. So, in answer to that, I'm. I'm, I'm not sure. I think I jumped right into a story and was doing it in color. And then I was thinking. Why am I doing that? So I, I, I think I really, I, I needed to step, I never think, I, this sounds like really pompous, but I don't think of an audience, or I'm not writing to an audience. I'm, I'm writing to be as clear as I can to kind of put a, it's like getting a story out that I want. It's like doing the clearest story that I can, kind of expressing that. Uh, and what that is, is it's hard to define what, you know, what and why, or why I feel compelled to, to tell those stories, but yeah, I, I'm, I, there's there's no audience that I'm writing to, necessarily. Even though I'm working in this medium, that's you know it's a popular medium and it's meant to be read, and that's what I want. Uh, I guess I want uh, s someone to feel the way I feel a little bit. And I think there's, I think, I'm guessing there's. I, I can tell that there's some people that do. I've I've had people here that were walking up when I was signing and saying, "This is the first thing. I love this book," and and I felt like this when I was struggling through a period of my life. And so that was, you know, that, that's really gratifying to, to, to have that, that kind of reaction of like, 
I got it. I've had people that say, yeah, I grew, you know, did you grow up in Cleveland? You know, because we did that in Cleveland. And you're like, we did exactly the same thing. I felt that way too. I'm like, no, I was from Seattle, so. But yeah, and, and, and uh, the work, you know, it trans or it has, you know, it gets published in Europe too and, and, uh, and is understood in that way. So it's not something, like for example, Black Hole wasn't about, you know, the 70s or it wasn't necessarily about I mean, it, it included things like drug culture and all that, but it wasn't necessarily about that. It was more about struggling through a certain period of your life and, and what that is. So, Can you hear someone? Sorry. I was just going to say, you're not alone on that. I mean, I think um, my favorite cartoonists and writers, they don't, it can be crippling to write for an audience, and that when you, the self exploration exploration in, in yourself, it's, um, it's just more genuine when it comes across. I mean, I yeah. identify a lot of work that way. Jules Pfeiffer was up here, and of course I'm not going to be able to paraphrase him, but he was like, he, he said something similar. He was like, I'm just hoping that someone, you know, understands what I'm, what I'm getting at. There's a kind of assumption that that's going to be the case. But I'm sorry, there, there was someone back. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I, I'm looking at a, a lot of things. I'm looking, I don't know, I, I'm look, picking up things here, but I mean, there's all the, the obvious people that, that you can name. Uh, I've been reading Gabrielle Bell. I think she's great. I've, I've been reading uh, um, Carol Tyler, someone who was here a couple of years ago, and, and I can't believe that she's not, you know, put up on a pedestal. She's amazing. The folks kind of seem like they kind of went, came and went. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of people, so I, I, I'm paying attention to what's out there, and, and uh, I think by, at this point, I'm not necessarily influenced by people. I think all, all those influences are kind of like those things that got embedded, you know, when I was five years old or something like that. But, um, but yeah, I, I certainly like looking at new things, and, and I love, love seeing, you know, discovering something new or discovering a new artist. Uh, it's great. Oh, that's not a good question for me. You're gonna, you're gonna <laughs> see me tear up. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm good. Um, yeah, actually, I don't want to answer that question. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, that would be that would be two days ago. <laughs> now, in all seriousness, he, he, he was asking whether I felt uh, whether the kind of confidence you have, um, that is a continual thing. I mean, that's, that never goes away. There's never that sense of like, ah, oh, I've made it. I can see some kind of physical, like there's a book and there's a substantial printed object and that, there's something satisfying about that. But as far as the sense of, oh, I'm moving on to the next thing and that one was great and this one's gonna be even better, that, that has never existed in, I don't think ever will. I, get, I, I think part of the, the process of, of, of creating is, is that sense of doubt maybe. Or if there is a sense of self-satisfaction, then, you know, then, then you're just kind of cranking something out maybe. It's like, I can do this, this is easy. You know, if it's easy, then, then you, I don't know. That's the best I can answer that. Sure. Yeah. Well, he. Sure. There's probably I don't know how old your son is, but there's some books that he probably shouldn't read, because uh, I mean it was he's really a. I don't know how familiar everybody is with the Tintin series, but uh, he really was of his time. He you know he was I think tin, the first was created in the 20s, so. Um, you know, he goes to the Belgian Congo, and you know, he's, uh, if it's, there's you know, incredible racist humor and kind of violent, weird slaps. You know, he's blowing up. He's like drilling a hole in the back of a rhinoceros and filling it with dynamite and blowing it up, and that's funny. Uh, so <laughs> that got edited out eventually, but th that's the original version. So yes, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that are of that specific time period. Not to say that you know, I th I, you know, he he disavowed them later on. There was, you know, there was uh, 
caricatures of Jews that were just, you know, oh, uh, you know, really pretty nasty stuff. That got edited out eventually um, in the later editions. Um, but there's also, there's kind of a, there, there's a, for me, there's kind of a core period, kind of central period where it just, you can, for me, that just seems like he's moving forward and telling good, you know, good storytelling. The early stuff's a little bit clunky. It's, it's kind of, it's pleasant to look at and, and, and kind of, I like it all, but there's kind of a middle period where he's really doing some great stuff. Uh, after the war, uh, where he was, you know, he was, people thought he was a, not, I mean, a, he, he was working for an, an occupied, or a Nazi occupied paper. Um, yeah, he had some problems. I think after that, the wind kind of went out of his sails a little bit. I mean, he, he's, people will argue with me that his greatest work was you know, later on, but he didn't see, he seemed a lot less happy later in his life. It's a, good, it's a good question, and it's always one that's, that's kind of difficult for me to answer. Um, I read all the time, and for some reason that, that doesn't seem to be as direct of a, I'm not aware of those uh, of, you know, direct influences. Uh, I mean, there's things that crop up in the stories. There's, there's, in my stories, there's kind of sequences like, okay, I cribbed that from a, from a Hemingway short story. Uh, in, the, in the current series, there's, there's you know, there, William Burroughs plays a significant part in the in what the character is thinking about, and even in some some ways of how the story is kind of cut apart in in some ways. But as far as like, it's it's harder for me to think of like a direct influence of I love this kind of writing and I want to do that kind of writing. I think I think early on maybe I was looking at a lot of when I was doing my El Borba stories, which were kind of detective like fake. Detective stories. I was reading a lot of you know, classic noir detective stories, so that you know that was a direct sort of influence, probably. But yeah. Um, Charles, we're gonna have to cut it off there. Okay. Um, get ready for the next panel. Um, okay. So yeah, we do have the third book, um, Sugar Skull. It officially comes out next week, and um, luckily we were able to get some advanced copies. A lot of them sold. Um, thanks for coming out, and thanks for buying the books. Um, Charles will be signing in about half an hour at 2.30 upstairs at the Pigeon Press booth. It's um, W5253, and we have some left. And, um, yeah, I just want to thank everyone for coming out. Thanks for coming.